Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C., where we are covering the Center for a New American Security's annual conference, Navigating the Divide in National Security. And uh, one of the most uh, interesting panels was the second panel of the day here, uh, which was a terrific report done by two naval officers who are both now uh, fellows. So you guys are in the academic world to broaden your, your careers. We got Tom Sugart, who is uh, uh, over at CNAS as uh, the military fellow uh, submariner. Uh, and and we also have Javier Gonzalez, who is with Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab, who's a surface warfare officer. Guys, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Vago. Great Thank you. Your guys' report is called First Strike, China's Missile Threat to U.S. Bases in Asia. Full disclosure, you guys did this through uh, all publicly available sourcing, does not involve any classified information uh, whatsoever, and that you guys are not speaking for the Defense Department, the Department of the Navy, uh, just yourselves as, a, as an academic exercise. Tom, I want to start uh, with, with you. Um, you, you, you showed some fascinating uh, broadcast television Chinese uh, videos, some of the stuff from also the People's Liberation Army uh, you guys had, which was, was really compelling viewing on what the Chinese view of this is going to be. Talk to us a little bit about China's strategy, the kind of systems they've got arrayed, and, and what China hopes to achieve uh, with these kind of capabilities at the very outset of any potential conflict. So where we went from with this is, uh, you know, we, we, we took a look at open source discussions of uh, Chinese, the, the doc doctrine behind the PLA Rocket Force, People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, and basically used those discussions of the, what has been, we found at open source that they have said they would go after in terms of target categories as part of a preemptive strike. Now China has, a, you know, again, per their own discussions, has what they call active defense, which they claim is a defensive strategy. But if you read between the lines, or actually not between the lines, if you read uh, more deeply, uh, our, a lot of our commentators have said that, you know, that, that a count, what they could be considered a counterattack in their minds, which would actually be the first part of a shooting war, could happen as a result, to, as a response to a mere threatening of their sovereignty. Uh, and their doctrine talks a lot about preemptive strikes and about seizing the initiative right away. So what we took a look at really was, there's been other work previously uh, more focused on Air Force bases and whatnot on the kind of things, the kind of th targets they would go after and what that would look like. We decided to broaden that in our own independent research into, well, if you took all of the things that they'd said they would go after in their do open source doctrine, what does that look like? And how many targets are we talking about, Javier? So uh, when we did the analysis, we came up with approximately 500 targets, but this is based on our analysis alone. Uh, but we look at the missile doctrine, as uh, was stipulated in some of the findings that we found, and uh, it clearly uh, allow us to determine uh, up to 500 targets, but I think if you if we look deeper, you can find up to 600 targets, and uh, we just decided just to keep it in a very manageable, um, you know, scenario. And and what are the primary targets? Right, everybody has Guam, uh, you know, as one of them. What are what are the array of targets in the region that are going to be priorities for the Chinese to try to take out? You know, within the first five minutes of a of a conflict. So that's one of the key things for us. Well, I think we we determined that command centers will be one of those key um, targets, um, and other targets like communications hubs, um, um, air and naval bases. Um, so you're talking, about, you're, you're talking about Yokosuka, you're talking about Sasebo, Iwakuni, we're Anderson. Talking about all, we're talking about all naval bases within Japan itself. So that includes Iwakuni, Sasebo, Yokosuka, obviously Okinawa. Um, uh, we, what we did, though, in the analysis is we try to stay away from uh, Guam, and we, that, we did that on purpose. Um, and why so? Well, you know, so we, a lot of what we did here was just taking, uh, just taking this open source analysis, figuring out what what targets fit their criteria that they have stated in open source, and then plugging those into other other people's previous uh, work, the way they use spreadsheets to do it, and then also using commercially available simulations, which we showed in the presentation. We found when we uh, when we tried that against Guam that Guam was pretty pretty seemed a pretty tough nut to crack based on the the there's already a Thad battery there there's already we think a Patriot battery there uh, and again everything we're saying in terms of defenses that are there that's just things that we read uh, in open source um, so based you know plugging those into the simulations it seemed like Guam was a, seemed a pretty tough nut to crack at the open source level uh, additionally one would think that 
a strike on Guam would potentially significantly escalate a conflict, and we would think the Chinese would try to maybe avoid that. What I want to ask you guys next is about the defensive capabilities that we have arrayed in the region. You guys looked at what's already been deployed, and basically one of the things that you see is, for example, um, the THAAD battery that's in uh, South Korea is an important piece of it that was deployed. A decision was made by the last administration, and it appears, despite the change in government, that's going to stay there. But in Japan, you found that most of the Japanese capabilities are all aimed at stopping an attack from North Korea and, and not from China. Talk to us a little bit about how effective the systems that are already deployed in the region would be to actually defend any of these core key uh, targets that the Chinese want to attack. So I, I'd emphasize first, we're not Army Air Missile Defense guys. So uh, we don't know anything classified about, about those systems, uh, have any, any, any additional information. What we did was basically, again, take the, we built a notional missile strike based on what they said their doctrine would go after and the target set that we found. And then we put in place um, those systems that, would, based on what we could see in, in, on Google Earth, press announcements, et cetera, where it looked like there's probably uh, missile defense batteries in various places in Japan and, and around uh, U.S. bases. We put those in place, and then in two different ways, we use a spreadsheet in one case and a commercially available war game simulation in the other to test, to, to throw that missile strike at those defenses and see what happens. Um, in the case of the spreadsheet, we used the similar kinds of uh, methods of calculation and similar assumptions for effectiveness that other defense analysts have used. Uh, for the wargaming simulation, we put the units in place. They have the effectiveness they have in the simulation. We didn't touch any of the characteristics, and we saw what the results were as those interacted with the incoming uh, Chinese missiles. And Javier, why don't you tell us exactly how effective those defenses were <laughs> against, I mean, it, it, it really compelling viewing because it's, a, it's an absolute deluge. You see all the counter batteries going off, and a lot, and, you, and what you noted is, I, or I think it was you, all of those little white pops you see are actually impact points for, for weapons. So I think you alluded to it already. It wasn't very effective. Based on open sources and based on what with the analysis that we've done, um, you can see clearly if you look at bases like Iwakuni and Sasebo, that at least in our analysis and the open source research that we've done, there was no missile defense available for those bases. So what that means is in the Chinese attack, there is no protection for those bases. Um, Obviously, everybody know, understand pitcher batteries for the most part and how capable those are. But if you, have, if you see the sheer numbers of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles coming in into Japan, then you can see that the amount of missile defense available in Japan is not going to be enough to sustain you know, a uh, large missile rate from the Chinese um, and one of the things that you saw in the, uh, in the video was something that's long been discussed, that some of these are point strike missiles, right, that are, that are designed to penetrate hardened targets or to actually hit the target. But the others are area denial. There are a lot of cluster bombs and munitions designed to shred aircraft, shred tank farms and things like that. Does that make the challenge significantly more complicated? Well, I mean, there's certainly been plenty of discussion uh, in the community about the vulnerability of fixed bases to these kind of weapons. Uh, and again, the, the capabilities we're seeing are what we saw on Google Earth. You know, we don't know for sure what those are, or, you know, we didn't see the tests. We're just seeing what's available in open, in open source imagery. It's what it looks like as submunitions against what it looked like vehicle targets. Again, um, uh, fuel depots, et cetera, all the things they've talked about in the doctrine, we found what looked like those targets out yeah. in the desert. Yeah, and to express, uh, to explain this, I mean, that was sort of like another key, you know, th this was, this. you know, if, if you had the full recording, I, I, sub I, I suggest people go and find it. But one of the things that you guys found is that the Chinese, again, with publicly available satellite imagery, that the Chinese have actually built facilities that look an awful lot like Yokosuka, for example, and silhouettes of things that look an awful lot like a Burke as a former destroyer driver, you probably recognize that silhouette. Absolutely. And, and, and if you if you look at uh, the analysis on the report and you go back in Google Earth, you can do this yourself. You can go back into the Gobi Desert, and I think we provided the coordinates in the, uh, in the report. You can see the silhouettes, and it clearly that looks like Yakuska. Um, now, you guys also noted that all is not lost. I think, Tom, you're the guy who made the point that just because they've got an enormous number of very inexpensive missiles and that we may appear to be on the wrong side of the cost trade-off on that, given that the defensive missiles are significantly more expensive, with some tailoring and some thinking, the inventory that we have today can actually be used to bolster defenses regionally. Well, there definitely would be to be some significant investment involved. Um, that's what it seems like, seems like to us. Uh, but it seems to us that, uh, you know, by using existing technology uh, and care, you know, making additional investments, again, we took 
our models, we plugged in additional units and investments, and we, again, we threw the same strike at it to see what happens. And the, we saw the results that were significantly better. And, and so what are some of those capabilities, uh, Javier, that, that you guys put into it? Because obviously there was Navy uh, missile defense ships that you were forward deployed that were not in, in the first scenario. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things that would be added and where you would add them in order to be able to give that sort of broader coverage. Because the point that you guys made, which I thought was a great one, was you also want this to deter China, right? That you're actually inviting a potential problem by, by transmitting weakness as opposed to transmitting strength, where they look at the situation and say, man, you know what? All we're going to do is start a war but not achieve our opening gambit gain. Yeah, so uh, when we did the initial model and simulations, one of the things that we did not include was ballistic missile defense ships on station 24-7. For the later scenario, the later missile defense scenario thereafter, we did include it, uh, two ballistic missile defense ships on station, one in the Sea of Japan, the other one in the East China Sea. Um, one of the changes that we did also in the mainland of Japan was we added five THAAD batteries. I know that sounds like a lot, but that's the amount of the THAAD batteries that we thought we needed to actually have you know, an effective defense against those mass rate of cruise missiles coming in and ballistic missiles coming into uh, Japan. So five that batteries, and we also added two dedicated Patriot batteries to those bases that I discussed earlier in Iwakuni and Sasebo to protect those bases as well. Um, and also, we, we proposed some doctrinal changes. Um, and you can see those more clear on the report, but basically, the scenario looks completely different when you're looking at the scenario from the mass rate perspective instead of a Chinese or South Korean, I mean North Korean scenario with a limited amount of ballistic missiles coming into Japan. It's completely different when you look at the problem from the Chinese perspective and a mass rate coming into uh, Japan and so the U.S. bases in Japan as well. And, and what are those alterations that you guys would make? So again, specifically, uh, part of our assumption with the first scenario where we, where we think a current BMD laydown looks like is based on the discussion that we had about the likelihood of preempt or the apparent practicing of preemptive strikes and the discussion in their in their doctrine was we assumed we got caught, caught flat-footed and so we did not assume the presence of any BMD ships on station ready to go uh, for the second scenario we're assuming that you know that we have some warning that we're being very conscious of that uh, we make additional investments in BMD ships with the the missiles that are being tested right now the SM3 block 2a I believe it is um, uh, with notional characteristics for those. And again, additional de dedicated batteries in Iwakuni and Sasebo. Now, for again, for all we know, there are, there are Patriots there right now. We just weren't able to find any evidence that there were, or, or at least that they were in a position to, to defend those bases against the Chinese missile raids. And one last question. Um, in your modeling, um, did you, how important were inventories and stockpiles of munitions? Because oftentimes folks talk about uh, the defensive problem and say, oh, you know, the ship has a loadout until you realize, like, the other guy is going to hurl everything, including the kitchen sink at you in that initial volley, whether they're DF-11s, DF-15s, DF-16s, 21s, 26s. It, it's not like they've been under-investing in that missile arsenal. Um, I think you guys concluded that on that uh, sort of the short-range ballistic missile, the 1,000 kilometer, they've got 15 or 1,200, 1,500 or so of those. That's what the DOD, latest DOD report says. That, that's the DOD report that says. And then there's a whole bunch more anti-ship ballistic missiles. They've got a couple of hundred of those, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, um, uh, a noted surface, war, uh, surface warfare friend of mine said, you know, uh, there, there's nothing that suggests that after making hundreds of missiles that are only going to shoot handfuls of them uh, at us, uh, God forbid, if things happen. How important is having large amounts of defensive weapons on hand. That's the first piece of the conventional sort of weapons. But also, what's the role of rail guns and lasers? So, um, yeah, we, so our, our assumptions for our analysis were that the batteries that were in place were fully stockpiled. I mean, that's, we assumed that they had, that all the launchers were full and that all the, all the missiles uh, inv that were there uh, were, you know, the, the cells were full. Uh, for the second scenario, uh, for the SM3s and the BMD ships, you know, we assumed significant investment in having significant numbers of, of weapons on board those ships. Um, in terms of rail guns, H, you know, high-velocity projectiles and lasers, uh, it does seem like in the long run that's we're going to need to develop those to, again, bend this cost curve. Uh, our point is just that I, we don't think we should just surrender um, you know, until, we, until those happen, that we just give up on BMD, layer, layered BMD with available technology in the meantime. And I think more importantly, I don't think we can afford waiting that long until these capabilities are fully developed and back into the fleet. Um, in the meantime, we need to do something, and that's part of the analysis that we did in some of our findings, that something needs to happen now. It cannot wait until the uh, uh, you know, lasers and, uh, and high-velocity projectiles are back in the fleet.
guys, thanks very much. Terrific report, even better presentation. Thanks very much for doing it, highlighting an absolutely critical uh, issue. Tom, Javier, thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.